Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome here you to NUPI. We appreciate you uh, spending the afternoon for us. I think we're going to have a, a very interesting afternoon. We have uh, with us uh, Yun Yun Ang, who is a uh, Associate Professor in Political Science with the University of Michigan. And uh, she's going to talk to us about directed improvisation, uh, how China escaped the poverty trap. Uh, as you know, this is linked to uh, her book uh, that, she, that came out, I think it is this year, is it? And uh, her book has attracted uh, quite a lot of attention. As, as somebody in the <coughs> academic field who also publishes books, we're envious of the kind of attention that, that, that her book has attracted really, uh, I think, uh, and that is because of the, uh, the research that she's undertaken and the findings in her book that has uh, really touched a lot of people working in this field. Uh, she's come to us at the, at the end of a European tour uh, where she's been to uh, the OECD in Paris and, and to her colleagues at ODI in London and, and various others, and this come after talks where she's been invited to the World Bank and the United Nations, so lots of people working in the development field and doing research in the development field have been taken by this book and by the research that has gone into this. So we, we're very interested to, to hear more directly from Yoon about uh, her research. Uh, I should mention as well that the book won the 2017 Peter Kustenstein Book Prize. For, outstanding, for an outstanding book in international relations or, and comparative politics or political economy. So it's really also been recognized in the academic field as an outstanding piece of work. And Yuna is going to talk to us she's about the book, but really about the topics that are introduced in the book or addressed in the book. So she's going to talk to us really about how do organizations effectively transform and cope with changing environments. And what does this tell us about uh, building adaptive capacity. And she'll use China as an example, what the book was about. But interestingly, in a book, uh, those of you who will have a chance to look at it, she also, in the end, compares it to some experiences in Africa, and in Europe, and, and in America. I'm sure we'll hear more from, from Yuan when she talks. Uh, let me say as well that uh, this seminar, like most of our seminars here at NUPI, will be live streamed. Uh, so uh, both her discussion and, of course, our questions and discussion session later uh, will be live streamed and will be available afterwards on the NUPI YouTube channel as well. So Yun, uh, delighted to invite you up to the podium and uh, to listen to your introduction. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Cedric, for the very warm and kind introduction. Let me begin by first extending my warm gratitude to NUPI for having me here. It's not only my first time speaking at NUPI, it's also my first time visiting the beautiful city of Oslo. So I'm immensely excited and grateful to be here. Um, today I'm going to talk about, um, give you an outline of my book, but as Cedric very nicely summarizes, it's not just about my book, but about a lot of the big questions that we've been grappling with in the field of development, about how do we promote development, about the relationship between development and good governance, adaptive capacity, and so forth. Um, so this is um, my book, which you've saw the, uh, seen in the cover. It came out 2016 in Cornell University Press. And the title itself tells you the task that I was undertaking, how China escaped the poverty trap. So I'm now going to do a very American thing, which is to give you my answer <laughs> on my first slide. Okay? Um, so my short answer is China escaped the poverty trap through a system of directed improvisation. Now let me explain what that means. When China decided to open its markets in December of 1978, which is 40 years ago, the Chinese Communist Party leader Deng Xiaoping decided that China was not going to democratize. They were going to keep a monopoly of power on the Chinese Communist Party. But they were going to change things within the party. They were going to change the functions and the authority of government. And these changes happen in this system that I call directed improvisation. What happens? is that the central leadership changes its functions from that of a commander who gives commands 
to that of a director who shapes and influences the processes of problem solving at the bottom levels. And this top-down direction is then combined with bottom-up improvisation using existing resources by local governments throughout China. And one of the things I'm going to point out is that China is a very big country and that the bureaucracy, therefore, is also one of the largest, if not the largest, in the world. China's bureaucracy is the size of 50 million bureaucrats. 50 million is the size of South Korea's population. Right, so we're talking about a really massive organization here. And it is through this combination of top-down direction and bottom-up improvisation that you get a very distinct pattern of development within China, which is diverse solutions according to local conditions and according to stages of development. So I think this is a pattern of development that we often do not know about China because on the outside, the image of China is you know, unified, strong, authoritarian. But in fact, if you look within China, you find that there is tremendous diversity and tremendous tailoring of solutions to local conditions. And in fact, this idea of diverse solutions tailored to local conditions is not alien to Chinese philosophy, because this is an ancient Chinese proverb, and Chinese proverbs you know, usually come in four words. And the exact translation of these four words are, according to place, tailor a good fit. Right? And so you know, when I show these Chinese words to my Chinese colleagues, they are both surprised and pleased because they realize, oh, OK, actually, we do understand this concept. It's just that we didn't have the modern development you know, jargon for it. So in short, this is what I'm going to argue today, that reform era China, surprisingly, is that probably one of the best illustration of hashtag adaptive development and hashtag complexity principles before these words became buzzwords in global development. Okay? And, but I wanted to add that, to be sure, there are certainly times when China acts like a typical top-down authoritarian regime. There are times when it suppresses information on the internet. There are times when it violates human rights. There are times when it tries to control the stock market, for example. But whenever it acts like a typical top-down command system, it almost always fails. But the times that China succeeds is when it learns to combine top-down direction with bottom-up improvisation. So this is the part of the story that I think most people do not know. And so this is the story I'm going to tell you today. OK, great. So because of the time limitations that we have today, I'm not going to go through every part of the argument. But I want to go into a little bit more depth about this part, which is what does bottom-up improvisation using local resources among local governments look like in China? Okay, so this is going to be the focus. And then at the end of the talk, we're going to come back and look at the whole big picture. So before we talk about China, now I'm going to ask everyone to take a few steps back and think on a more abstract level about the big problem of development. And the big problem of development is how can poor countries escape the poverty trap? Let me begin by defining the poverty trap, since different people might define the problem differently. Basically, if you look at developing countries today, their problem is not only that they are economically poor, but also that they have an abundance of normatively weak institutions. So when I say normatively weak institutions, I mean institutions that are regarded as weak or wrong or backward by first world standards, right? Corruption, patronage. Lack of rule of law, lack of democratic accountability, lack of transparency, and so forth. Right? So I add the word normatively just to stress that I'm not talking about institutions that are physically crumbling. They don't have to be. But just that they are wrong or weak by first world standards. So if you look at these two factors, what you realize is that when you're poor, your institutions are weak. And when your institutions are weak, it makes you poor. Right? So these two factors are mutually reinforcing, creating what we call a poverty trap. 
So for those of us who work in development, the obvious problem will be, well, what should we do? How should we get out of the trap? Should we change the institutions first, or should we grow the economy first? So this is like a chicken and egg problem. And a conventional institution for the past 20 years has been sort of a linear logic. You know, if it's so hard to make economies rich, let's fix the institutions first. So let's go to the third world. Let's get rid of their backward institutions. We will follow global best practices and establish good, strong institutions, right? And the logic is a little bit like, let's make these countries look like Denmark and look like Oslo, and then surely everything will be good from then on. But in practice, after 20 years of following this paradigm, I think many people in the development field have come to a consensus that in practice, it is really hard to establish good, strong institutions in poor countries because you need resources, you need implementation capacity, and you need a certain type of social norms to support these types of institutions. And in fact, I love this quote from Land Pritchard and Michael Woolcock, who are two leading voices in global development, they say that imposing best practices of good governance has not only been, has not only not delivered the benefits, but have been a root cause of the deep problems encountered by developing countries. Because developing countries, you know, they try to copy these best practices, they fail, and then they feel more disappointed, and then the vicious cycle actually gets worse. And in fact, in this article, uh, which has a brilliant title, they call it, When the Solution is the Problem. And what they mean is that in the past, we thought that good governance is the solution to the problem of poverty. And after 20 years, everyone realized, no, achieving good governance itself has become the problem, right? So we are back to this chicken and egg poverty trap problem. We all know at this point in time in the development field, the poor countries are stuck. So that's the consensus. In fact, if you look at the best-selling book in the development field, which I think many of you would be familiar with, uh, Why Nations Fail by Arthur Moklu and Robinson, they argue that if you want a country to be economically successful, you need to have good institutions. But if you don't, then you're pretty much stuck. So this is kind of the state of the art knowledge. We know that poor countries are stuck. But this state-of-the-art knowledge is not particularly helpful, right? Because what we really want to know is how then do you become unstuck? That's the big question. It is both a theoretical question and also a very practical question. And we want to get some answers to that. And so in order to find answers to this very practical and important question, what I do in my work is to turn to China for some unorthodox lessons. And for many obvious reasons, we should look to China because within one generation, this country has achieved a radical economic and social transformation, which then begs the question of how did they do it? Was it because they fixed their institutions and had good governance and democracy, which no, right? They did not do that. Or was it that they grew their economy first and then tried to fix their institutions? So, you know, it is a fascinating country to examine this very important question. So let me tell you what I found. Um, the cover image of my book itself gives you a little bit of information. Most people, when I ask most people, you know, make a guess which part of China is this picture taken in, most people would say, oh, this must be, you know, maybe Guizhou or Sichuan, the very poor western parts of China today. Uh, in fact, uh, I had insisted on picking this a photo for my book cover, and I and I had um, I was I very much appreciate my uh, editor at Cornell for respecting my choice because I told him I I didn't want any dragons or tigers or pandas. You know, it's not it's not it's not a takeout box. Um, I wanted this picture. The reason is that this picture is actually Guangdong Province in 1982. So if you know anything about Guangdong Province, it is the birthplace of Chinese capitalism. And 1982 was a few years after markets had opened. I'm sure today, if you go back to this scene, the scenery had already completely transformed. But I picked this photo as a cover to remind everyone that just a generation ago, China was a very poor country, which then makes us 
want to understand how did this happen. Right? So before I go into my findings and explanation, it is helpful, I think, to lay out a few facts for the audience here. Now, fact number one, prior to market reform, China was a very poor country. And because we hear so much about China's rise today, we often forget this basic fact. In 1980, GDP per capita in China is actually lower than bottom billion countries like Malawi, Bangladesh, and Chad. And no doubt, because it was a communist country, things like literacy rates, uh, the presence of barefoot doctors, you know, these types of public services were higher. But it was nevertheless still a very poor country. And so that's something to bear in mind. Fact number two, market reforms in China began under an authoritarian government, but this was a bureaucracy that was devastated and certainly not, the, not technocratic. So the government that existed when reforms first started is not the same government as the one you see today. So this distinction has to be sharply drawn. In particular, in the three decades under Mao, China underwent tremendous political tumult. The Cultural Revolution, which lasted just 10 years before market opening from 65 to 75, was especially devastating. Even Mao himself described the decade as utter chaos and all-out civil war. The Cultural Revolution, in particular, was targeted at the bureaucracy. It was Mao mobilizing everyone, in particular students, to attack authority. So bureaucrats were the main targets of persecution, torture, and killings. In that period, an estimated 2 million people died, not counting those who were tortured and beaten. Okay? So when market reform started, it was not only that the country was very poor, but politically, it was one that was devastated. Fact number three. In the first 30 years of reform, China famously lifted 700 million people out of abject poverty, but this was actually largely done without anti-poverty policies. This was largely done through market liberalization and national development. And as a result, what you see by about 2012 in China is that you have massive eradication of poverty along with rising inequality. And that is not paradoxical because that poverty was reduced by national development, not by targeted policies. So the targeted anti-poverty policies that we see in China today is actually a relatively new phenomenon. Okay. And just to add, why is this important for development? Because I think a lot of times in development, we focus on anti-poverty policies, yes? But we don't have as much attention put on understanding how is poverty reduced on a massive scale through market liberalization and development processes. So actually, China is a much better lesson of the former than, the, than in these uh, micro-level interventions. Fact number four, I'm from Singapore. And like Singapore, China is big. This is a fact that's very useful to keep in mind. In my, in my Europe tour this time, I was very struck by the vast cultural and regional differences between different European countries. And so it's very helpful to bear in mind as well that China is really more like EU than it is a country. Okay? So for example, let me see. Um, who, I think that's Hunan province. Hunan, no, that's Anhui province. Anhui province is the size of Britain. Hunan province is the size of France. Right? So every province in China is like the size of a European country. So this country is vast. So if we want to try to understand its development processes, it's not enough for you to talk about it as a homogenous whole, only at the national level. But it is necessary that we disaggregate this country and look at the regional differences. So what you see in my book is that what I've done is in addition to the national level analysis, I trace the life histories of different parts of China, both on the coast and in the interior, to look at how their paths diverge and converge over time. Okay, so now that we have these facts all in place, you are ready to take a snapshot of the story. And I'm going to take you to one of the local cases featured in my book. And this particular case, I call it Forest Hill City, which is in Fujian province. Fujian province is right here on the coast, which is uh, next to Taiwan. And because uh, Fujian province is on the coast, it is one of the first places in China to open its market and attract investments uh, and to grow rich. 
Um, and so when we look at the, co the, the experiences of cities on the coast, we might ask ourselves, now when they first started this development process in the 1980s and 1990s, what really happened? Like, what was the first thing that they did? If we follow the conventional wisdom in development, we would expect that, you know, they first eradicated corruption, established private property rights, had transparency, and hired technocrats, right? So if you sent a foreign expert to Forest Hill City in 1980, he would say, your bureaucracy is horrendous. It is filled with unqualified people, carried over from the Maoist era, um, everything here is really backward, it is rural. First, make it look like Oslo, and then we can talk about development, right? So probably it was sort of a week, if you dramatize what had happened, maybe it had looked like this. But in fact, the reality was anything but the conventional wisdom. The reality that I found is that in the 1980s and 1990s, when markets opened, what the city did was that it enlisted all of the civil servants in the city bureaucracy. So every city has about 20,000 civil servants to recruit investors using their personal relationships. So regardless of whether you are in the finance bureau, the environment bureau, a school teacher, a medical doctor, it doesn't matter. As long as you're in the public sector, you are all mobilized to go out there and find investors. Call your friends, call your relatives, and so forth. Okay? And why did they take, do this very unusual move? Several reasons. Like any other developing countries, they began with plenty of constraints. They had a bureaucracy that was inherited from the Maoist era. You cannot fire anyone. So you have to think about making the best use of these bureaucrats. And when you are a bureaucrat in a communist society, the one asset that you have is personal relationships, right? And so that was the logic behind that. In addition to immobilizing the entire bureaucracy to go out to seek investments, the civil servants were also given a cut of any investments that were made. So it was basically a high-powered high incentive system or a profit-sharing system. So it was highly capitalist in that sense, you know, but brought into the public sector. And then they mixed it with some communist systems. So every department was given a concrete target that this year you have to bring in a certain amount of investments and deliver a certain amount of performance. So if you take a look at this entire package of the strategies they use, it is anything but best practice. It is the last thing that <laughs> I think the UN and the World Bank would recommend. But, if, but then if you take a few steps back, you realize that these strategies are actually making best use of whatever resources that these cities had in 1980s, which was the communist systems and the personalistic relationships that exist. So it was really like a jumble of whatever existed at the time, but repackaged for the purpose of seeking new investments and for capital accumulation. The lesson here is that normatively weak or wrong inst institutions can be functionally strong. If you look at them from the first world standards, they're wrong, they should be rejected. But if you look at them from the functional point of view, does it work? Can I reuse it for my particular purpose right now? They can actually be very useful and effective. But these institutions do not last forever. Because once they work, by the 2000s, and the economy starts to take off on the coast, Economic changes create changes in the environment that feeds back into the bureaucracy. So specifically in the case of these cities, economic takeoff changes the resources that the cities have. They now have more money. They now have more capacity to attract qualified technocrats. It also changes their goals of development. So initially, all they wanted was any investment. It doesn't matter whether it was tofu or semiconductor, any investment is good. But as they got richer, they got more selective. Like, you know, all of us can relate to that. You know, when we were poor, we would eat anything. And as we get richer, we get a bit more picky with the food we eat, right? And so it's kind of a similar logic with cities and with countries. So with changes in resources and preferences, this then led to changes, gradual changes in the bureaucracies and institutions. So if you go to coastal cities today, you see a bureaucracy that is very, very different from 10, 20, or 30 years ago. You see a much more professionalized bureaucracy, 
and their function is to preserve a market that had already been built and that had already existed. But the bureaucracy that first created or supported the takeoff of a market was very different from the one that we now see. So I've told you a story that is specific to China. And now it is helpful to abstract from this story and think about what is the generic principles behind it. What are the generic principles that we can apply to any development setting? And what I'm going to argue is that development is not a linear process. It is a non-linear, co-evolutionary process, specifically one that evolves in three steps. The first step is what I call harnessing normatively weak institutions to build markets. If you go to any third world country, the one thing that they have in abundance are normatively weak institutions, right? So if you can even use a small percentage of what they have in abundance to build markets, isn't that something we should think about? And that's in fact exactly what we find in China. The first step is to use what you have to build markets. The second step is that the emergence of markets itself will create changes in resources and preferences that stimulate the selection of conventionally strong institutions. And the third step is that strong institutions preserve markets. So if you look at the three steps that I've laid out for you here, one of the distinctions that I want to stress is the difference between building markets and preserving markets. When you want to create something new, the challenges and the constraints of doing that is very different from preserving something that has already been created. The problem with conventional wisdom in development is that we really only focus on step three. And we forget that the task of building markets is in fact so different from that of preserving markets. This three-step system can be summed up in a very simple TED Talk-like maxim, which is that countries should start with what you have not with what you want. So if you're working in development, whatever communities that you're working with, it's a very practical question to ask, what does this community have? Use what they have to start the process of development. Okay? So a question that follows, I think, from this particular presentation of a stylized process is, is it the case that this process is unique to China? Because I think whenever we take any example from China, the instinct is, but it's Chinese. You know, it's so different. It's exotic, right? It's oriental. So you know, can't possibly find it in other parts of the world. And I want to emphasize that if you look at the last chapter of my book, this particular process and dynamic is, in fact, not unique to China. But it manifests in China in a particular way. So in the last chapter of my book, I look at the processes of market and institutional coevolution in three very different, ca different cases. The boom of regional trade in late medieval Europe, the financing of massive infrastructure projects in 19th century America, and the rise of the film industry, Nollywood, in Nigeria. Normally, you would think that there's absolutely nothing to do with each other in these cases. But in fact, they have a similar sequence. The similar sequence <coughs> is that in all three cases, people on the ground had harnessed normatively weak institutions to build markets, and only later on evolved conventionally strong institutions to preserve markets. To give you some example, the boom of regional trade in late medieval Europe did not start with private property rights. It started with communal property rights, a system that is very similar to what China evolved in the 1980s. And it was only 200 years later that private property rights evolved. In the case of America, America built its massive infrastructure like the Erie Canal, not through the tax-based public financing system that we see today, but it started with a non-transparent, risky, taxless public financing scheme that is very similar to what we see today in China. And then Nollywood in Nigeria, if you think about anything, if you think about Nigeria, anything you know about it, the stereotypical image is that Nigeria is corrupt, it's a failed state, it definitely does not have strong protection of intellectual property rights. 
So how is it that they could have a successful film industry? And the remarkable part of the story is that the Nigerian filmmakers very creatively turned piracy to their advantage, using it as a nimble, informal distribution network, and only very much later on focus on IPR protection and professionalization. So if you look at the three cases, what you'll find is that they have different contextual details. So context matters, but they have a similar sequence of development. So China is unique in its content, but it is not unique in its sequence and in its logic. So again, what's missing in the conventional wisdom, I would put this best-selling book, Why Nations Fail, in part three of my chart which is that the theory being laid out in why nations fail is not wrong, it is correct, but it is not complete. It is a theory of development for advanced industrialized countries like Norway. When you already have a capitalist market and it's already mature, you do need rule of law, you do need private property rights, you do need you know, all of these democracy, accountability, and all of the things we associate with good governance. But when you are trying to do development in a society that has not yet modernized or is trying to modernize, you need to make use of whatever institutions that those societies have. And this is the part that in the development field, we have had very, very little attention or knowledge about. Okay. All right, so conclusions and implications for development. So, so far in the last 20 minutes, I focus on kind of giving you a concrete sense of what it means to do bottom-up improvisation in China using existing resources by local governments. And it is useful to take a look at this big picture. And one might ask, you know, why is it that these local governments in China were able to behave in this highly flexible, adaptive way? And that is not automatic. It is also not unique to Chinese culture but it was conditional upon certain conditions, incentives, and parameters that were provided by the top-down leadership. So I won't go into all of them in detail, but I'll just highlight a few of these elements of top-down direction. For example, the central leadership does a very important job of setting boundaries for experimentation. So for those of you who might be familiar with the literature on complexity or adaptation, the general instinct is that more experimentation and more decentralization is always good. You know, take away the rules, give people as much freedom as possible. But that actually is a misconception of how adaptation works. Effective adaptation does require experimentation, but it also requires boundaries to be put on experimentation. What you find in a Chinese case is that the central government plays a role setting those boundaries. Specifically, it sends directives that tells local governments, these are certain areas that you should experiment on, but these are certain things that you cannot change. Right? And by setting up these rules, you get experimentation that is much more effective and that does not lead to chaos. Okay? These central government also, I would say, play a key role in defining what is success. Because if a society does not have a consistent view of what is considered successful development or the goals of development, people would be doing their own adaptation and thinking I'm doing the right thing. Right? So the central government plays that role of defining what that success is. And in China, they chose to define success, successful development as economic growth. And I'm not saying that normatively that's a good thing. I'm just saying as a matter of fact, that's what they did. And we see the social cost of that narrow definition of development, such as in environmental degradation. But because they chose to define development very narrowly in the beginning as economic growth, this definitely helped China to rapidly achieve capital accumulation. Today, China is rapidly changing its understanding of what is development. Okay. All right. So let me summarize with three takeaways that challenge the conventional wisdom. The first is the idea that building markets is not the same as preserving markets. The institutions, policies, practices that you need to support the takeoff of economies are not the same as the institutions that preserve mature markets. And the problem with development so far is that we do not make a distinction between stages of development. And the intuitive logic is 
if this is what you have in Denmark, if this is what you have in Washington, D.C., and Oslo, it must be the same things that Nigeria would need, right? So, and that's, that's the fallacy, and we need to make a distinction between these two stages and tasks of development. My second takeaway is that normatively weak institutions can be functionally strong. So when we apply the labels of good, bad, weak, strong, these are in fact normative labels, right? We are looking at these societies from first world standards. And so if you carry your first world standards and you go to a third world, everything looks bad, everything looks inadequate. But if you take away your normative lens and you realize that in fact most of the time, institutions, practices, norms can be neutral. You know, they evolve from that particular society. And if we're willing to take a neutral lens to evaluating institutions, that will help us to identify and activate the developmental potential of indigenous institutions in third world country. So that we can do development in a way that is very different from the convention and that respects local conditions. Okay? And the third takeaway is that effective adaptation doesn't automatically occur. As Cedric, I think it's familiar because of his own work on complexity. I think there's increasing sort of literature and embracing of complexity, adaptation. We all recognize that these are good things to do in development. But I think much of that discussion has stopped at saying that we should adapt without saying how can we adapt. So what you can find in my book is that I go from saying that we should adapt to operationalizing the problem of promoting adaptation. I mean, what are the specific conditions that you need to create so that people can adapt? And we can actually learn a lot from the Chinese case. As we learn from the Chinese case, it's not just about decentralization and experiments and more freedom. It also requires a lead actor to direct, to create enabling conditions for creativity. And of course, on the last note, I think it's um, appropriate to act that uh, when we think about creativity, we almost always connect it or associate it with, with democracies. It's useful to keep in mind that even in a non-democratic society like China, it is possible to have human creativity. And it is important to activate human creativity even in a non-democratic society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yuan. That was uh, very, very interesting. Uh, we now have uh, 20 minutes or so of, of uh, room for discussion, for questions, answers, for comments. So please, uh, the floor is open. Um, just indicate who you are, introduce yourself when you take the microphone. And uh, um, let's start with a question over there in the middle. Thank you very much for a very stimulating lecture. Uh, my name is Ivan Hoffman. I'm a semi-retired international civil servant, labor economist and statistician, working with the ILO. And I have two questions which you didn't really touch on in your presentation. One is the effects, especially in the future, of the emerging demographic dis equilibrium in China, both with respect to age distribution, to some extent sex distribution, and geographic distribution. And in particular, for the middle income to high income parts of China to retain their level of income, will they be able to recruit the skilled workers that they need, or do they need to import them from, for example, Norway? <laughs> Thank you very much. Can we take maybe three questions? Anyone else in the front there? Hi, uh, Jonas from the Central Bank. I'm a China economist. Um, so this was extremely insightful, uh, first of all. Um, so having been faced with the poverty trap there, China is kind of facing a middle income trap uh, at the moment. And this, this system of, of the combination of a particular type of top down and bottom up um, how is that going to work when they, um, on the technological front, is going to go from um, being adaptive 
um, to innovative. Thank you very much. And then we have a last question in front here. Hi, I'm uh, Hedda Flato from the University of Oslo. Um, I'm wondering if you could say, it, it, thank you, it's extremely interesting, by the way, your presentation. Um, I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about the most recent developments under the Xi administration. Um, I've uh, heard from Chinese scholars that, or um, suggesting that this increased top-down um, governance and uh, even also the, the uh, corruption campaign in some ways can stifle uh, local uh, improvisation and, and, and uh, um, experimentation. Uh, so I'm wondering if, if is China entering a new stage now in, in its development model? Um, and also just a small thing, when you, you pointed to, you said that now China has reached, or, or uh, the final point where you come to where you're supposed, the good institutions preserve markets. That's where you need, you said, rule of law, democracy, and so on. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I, it, that might be interpreted as uh, being in line with sort of modernization theory that uh, sort of democracy and, and rule of law will uh, develop that that you can't sort of you can't avoid it after you reach a certain level of development, and, and I'm just uh, curious about your thoughts on that. Thanks. Great, great question. Maybe I, mean, I should yeah three. take they, those they three because they, they quite seem to be um, to answer, and then we'll, we'll take it from there. And Thanks. I think they have a lot of uh, overlaps with uh, each yeah. one another as well. Well, thank you very much. These are excellent questions. Uh, the first set of questions about uh, demogra demographic changes in China. Well, I think that the common theme that seems to run through these questions is about, um, is China entering a new phase? The answer is yes, absolutely. So what I do in my book is to tell the story of 1978 to 2012. So that was the phase of development when China was trying to go from low income to middle income. And it must be emphasized that the challenges of going from low income to middle income versus from middle income to high income are radically different, right? So absolutely, China is now in a different phase ever since uh, President Xi Jinping came to office in 2012. I think we can put that as a, as a marker of a new phase. Um, and so in this new phase, there are many, many new challenges that they need to deal with. And one of it is the one that you uh, asked about, which is demographic changes. Um, China has reached a point, because part, in large part because of the one-child policy that was instituted by Deng Xiaoping uh, in the 1980s. China now has this very unusual situation where it has a rapidly aging population, but it is still a developing country. Right? And so they recognize these challenges, and this means that they need to invest a lot of resources in pensions, in caring for the aged population. They will have a shortage of cheap, you know, young labor from the countryside that previously had powered you know, low-cost manufacturing. That is why when you look at manufacturing and industrial policies in, in China today, they are absolutely conscious of this, of this problem. And they are actively, very aggressively pushing for industrial upgrading, for automation, even for really high-tech things like artificial intelligence or what they call um, Industrial Revolution 4.0, you know, to, to in order to sort of continue as an industrial giant, but without relying on the cheap mass labor that used to power China's growth in the 80s and in the 90s. So that would be my answer to the question about labor. Um, and uh, Joan's question about, um, now that China has reached middle income, how does directed improvisation work or fit in the story? I think there is some overlap with your question as well. I think my um, responses to that in general, and, you, um, and I talked about that in the final chapter of my book in some reflections, is that I think that in the first sort of 35 years of China's development, there have been a development that was very much state directed, right? And it was also a development where the main sources of policy innovation came from within the party and within the bureaucracy. So if you look at the story that I tell, it doesn't have so, so very much about civil society. And that was deliberate, that was the fact. It was a process that was with the state as the main actor. The local governments, not civil society in the conventional sense, were the improvisers. I think moving on from 2012 onward, because China has reached you know, a middle income stage, 
I think has reached a point where the source of innovation needs to come from society rather than the bureaucracy because the adaptive functions of the bureaucracy are running out for several reasons. One of these reasons is that in the past, the bureaucracy just needed to do one thing well, which was economic growth, capital accumulation. But today, the bureaucracy cannot just do one thing well. They are expected to do a multitude of things well. Right? And as soon as you require a bureau bureaucrat to do multiple things well, nothing is done well. <laughs> right? And so it was, China has reached a point where it cannot rely on the bureaucracy to be that innovator as it was before. So it needs to re rely on society. And when you need society to be providing the innovation, I do think that you do need to provide that freedom of expression as well. So this is a stage in time where I think political freedom in a more conventional sense is now deeply relevant to China's continued economic reforms. That's it, however, and this is something I'm still thinking about. I think that it might be possible that the advent of cutting aid technology might throw a wrench into the story. We've never seen artificial intelligence, e-commerce, being used and applied on such a wide scale. Um, and now China is a leader in these sort of leading technologies. I'm not very sure what the implications of that are, but it could be that because of the advent of these new technologies, China can continue its economic growth by leveraging these technologies without the conventional political reforms that we think about. That, that is possible, so we'll have to keep watching that. Um, and your very good question about, and this is indeed a comment that I hear very much, very often from my colleagues in China, which is that once she came into office, he has a very different administration, right? He's, very, he's much more top-down. He uses uh, targets, coercive methods. He has a very an aggressive anti-corruption campaign. In my view, I do think that all of these sort of steps and uh, policies uh, stifle bureaucratic entrepreneurism. I, I do agree with that. Um, but in my more recent research that extends on my book, I do, I do have a surprising finding, and this is still preliminary, but I have analyzed the uh, language of all of the directives that were ever produced by the Chinese government over time. And I expected that um, over time, we would see less and less room for experimentation in these directives, given, given this discourse that's been out there. What I find is actually the opposite. The Xi administration has been the time in China where you find the greatest amount of room for experimentation in the language of the policies. That's a surprise for me, and we're still trying to dig why we find that, but the data speaks for itself. So it, I think it may be possible that outwardly he, he, he manifests a very centralized strongman image and he does have top-down coercive approaches, but maybe he has certain, he has provided certain room for freedom and experimentation that we don't normally hear about. So at least that's what I find so far. So I will continue with the research. Oh, one last point about modernization literature. Um, there, are several very key differences between my arguments and modernization literature. Modernization literature is a linear argument. It says economic growth and then, no, it says economic growth and then democracy, right? But it doesn't explain where economic growth comes from. And so my argument is no, economic growth comes from leveraging normatively weak institutions, including non-democracy itself, to start markets. That's, that's one key difference. And the other key difference is I think modernization literature doesn't take into account things like the advent of cutting edge technology that I've just talked about. I think that might just radically change the dynamics of political reforms in ways that we have not seen before historically. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuen. Uh, is there another round of questions? We have one question here. Yep, should I just uh, ask? Um, uh, thank you for an uh, interesting uh, presentation. My name is uh, Ace Dan Oxenwag. I'm from the National Center of Foreign Languages in Education. Um, 
based on your presentation and your examples and your book, uh, I find it easy to jump to the conclusion that um, it's not possible to have economic growth without an authoritarian regime. Um, <laughs> a democratic open country playing by the rules of the IMF and the World Bank uh, will not be able to execute the top-down um, strategies um, that you show in your example. So, would like your comments on that and uh, would love to have some examples. Maybe I can also uh, throw in a question. Uh, I think one thing you indicated earlier on is, is the big diversity in China. Mm -hmm. And you know, in, in terms of uh, your questions to the three, uh, your answers to the three questions in the, in the previous round, I was just wondering to what degree the diversity that we still have between you know, areas of China that are still developing, that are still in the um, lower income levels, if you like, compared to you know, what that variety does to the context of China. Mm -hmm. And then perhaps uh, related to the last question and some of the previous questions, uh, the question about can strong institutions adapt? Uh, how, how would we then need to manage strong institutions to, to stimulate adaptation and innovation in this context? Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. These are two excellent questions. The first, uh, the first one is um, uh, thank you for raising that question because I think that's on many people's minds. Yes, yes. It's very easy to jump to conclusion, as you said, that you need to have an authoritarian government in order to have economic growth, including directed improvisation. And I would say that that is incorrect. Let me explain why. Okay. It so happens to be the case that China is an authoritarian system. And so when I use this case to illustrate my argument, it is intuitive to draw the conclusion that authoritarianism is at least a precondition. But in fact, if you look at the other three cases that I had briefly laid out for you, Nigeria being a very good case, you can have bottom-up improvisation with some form of top-down direction, even in non-democracies. But there will be key differences between a dictatorship like China and democracies. The difference is that when you have adaptive development in China, number one, it is led by the state. The state, the government, plays the role of the director, yes? Number two, when you do have adaptive development in a dictatorship like China, it occurs throughout the country because the government can wave a wand and say, okay, now we're going to flip a switch and do something different. So you see these changes just unfold across the entire country. In a democracy, when you see adaptive development, there are two key differences. The first is that the, the, the actor who plays the director may not be the government. And it usually is not the government because by definition, the government in democracies are constrained and weak. Right? because we deliberately limit the, the power of government in democracies. So very often in democracies, you'll find that the person playing this role of a director could be, for example, um, a development agency. It could be an NGO. Right? It, could be, it could sometimes be the government or a combination of these. But it wouldn't be the central dictatorship that's directing. The second difference in a democracy is that when you do see adaptive development, it tends to happen only in pockets of the economy with unintended spillovers. So again, Nollywood is a good example. It's not, it's not a success that happens throughout the national economy. It only happened in the film industry. And it specifically was born in the film industry because that was a sector that no one cared about. Because it was a sector that no one cared about, in particular the government completely neglected it, it gave a space for local actors to take advantage of that space. Right? And then after Nollywood became successful, it actually had unintended spillovers. It inspired um, Gollywood in Ghana and um, in Kenya as well. I think they call it Riverwood. So it had some regional spillovers. It also had spillovers within the economy, but all of it was unintended and not part of a national policy. Uh, Nollywood today in Nigeria, by the way, it's not like just a sideline business. It actually is the country's nat uh, second largest source of employment after agriculture. In 2016, it's an industry worth $6 billion, second largest source of exports after oil. 
So when you do have adaptive development, even when it's within only a pocket of the economy, it can have very considerable effects. Right? So these are the distinctions that we have to draw. Adaptive development can happen in an autocracy and in a democracy, but they will manifest in different ways and be played by different actors. Okay. So I don't want to, um, I don't want you to sort of write off this story as just a China story and just a story about dictatorship. Far from it. It's just that China happens to provide a very rich illustration. And then um, going to uh, Cedric's um, question about um, regional diversity and its role in China's continued development. Regional diversity continues to play a very big role in China's development as well as in its economic restructuring. And in one of my chapters, as you'll see, um, there is tremendous inequality of speeds of development across China. Um, development happened first on the coast. They rapidly industrialized and became rich. And the rest of China were many magnitudes poorer and less industrialized. Uh, what, you saw, what you see by the 2000s is a surprising development, which is that these interior parts of China, their economy suddenly roared to life. In the past, they, were, they did not grow uh, as fast. And the reason for that is that once the coastal province, they've gone to middle income and they want to move to services, they don't want their factories anymore. So they are starting to move these factories en masse into the interior parts of China. So I have a paper, a separate paper about about domestic investment. Domestic investment from the coastal parts of China into the central provinces are in fact 2.5 times larger than all of the FDI than, that enters China. And this is again a fact that we don't hear about because we hear a lot about foreign investment going to China. We don't hear very much about domestic investment from the wealthy parts of China going to the less wealthy parts of China. So it, is, it does play a big part in China's development. And then you find a question about can strong institutions adapt? I think absolutely. In fact, I want to stress, again, going back to a modernization point, modernization theory point, I think modernization theory tends to, it's a teleological theory, right? And it gives the impression that once you've become the first world, all first worlds are alike. But we know, living in the first world, that all first worlds are not alike, right? Norway is very, very different from Denmark, very different from Paris, very different from London, very different from Tokyo. So in fact, first worlds are very, very different. And, in, and there is a literature about varieties of capitalism. Among advanced capitalist societies, you have some that is, like America, free market liberalism, and some that's socialist. And so therefore, I think, definitely, even if a country like China has if it would one day reach a high income level, we do not need to expect that it would look just like any other European market economy because it could very well be a market advanced economy that has characteristics that are very different from what we find in the European variety, which is exactly what we see in Europe today. So I would leave, I would, and on that note, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Yun. I think uh, we have to do end it there. Um, thank you very much for, for coming to Oslo and uh, giving us this talk. We were really keen to hear more about your book. Um, and thank you all of you for spending this hour with us. Uh, appreciate your support and your encouragement and your interest in, in the topic. So thank you very much. Yvonne. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you.